Raymond Capt, Bible archaeologist and historian. We read in the Bible, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Because God is a builder of this and other worlds, he is often referred to as the supreme architect of the universe. The scripture substantiates this title by speaking of him as a wise master builder and of his laying the cornerstone of creation. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Hence it follows that architecture is as old as the universe. When God, its supreme architect, wanted an earthly house or temple in which to dwell among men, he gave to them the plan of the building he would have them build. A temple is a great building. In a higher sense, a house of worship. In a very highest sense, a habitation of God. However, unlike temples designed by men, Solomon's temple was designed by God himself and was communicated first to King David, who communicated the same to his son Solomon. The scriptures in many places employ ideas borrowed from architecture to convey to the mind of man spiritual and heavenly things. A good man is called a living stone, a spiritual house, God's building, and a temple of the Holy Spirit. The house of God, known as Solomon's temple, also used architecture to convey spiritual truths. But Solomon's workers had to work out the plan given. Had not each man worked as God planned, the temple would never have been completed to reveal God's plan for each of us, to build his or her own spiritual house, of which Solomon's was but a type. The importance of this symbolism is shown to us by the amount of attention given to it in the Bible. It is often referred to by the prophets, the apostles, even by Jesus Christ. But since the history of the temple is a part of the Bible, its symbolism also a part of the Bible, is every stone, pillar, and piece of timber has a special meaning for us. Well, since the glory of the temple and its services, which were only shadows of better things to come, have passed away, its symbolism gives us a glimpse in prophetic vision of a new creation. To quote the scriptures, when old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. This study is designed to bring to you a new look at modern Bible translations of the description of the temple and its furnishings authenticated by archaeological discoveries made this century. And most importantly, it points to you a new view of its prophetic symbolism and the astonishing fulfillment of this symbolism. The reason for the building of Solomon's temple is found in the second book of Samuel where we read that King David thought it wrong that he should dwell in a permanent house while the ark of the Lord dwelt within curtains. Nathan the prophet agreed with the king and told him to go ahead and do something about it. But before David's plans had matured, God told him of a different plan. Although he would be allowed to take preparatory steps, he would not be allowed to carry out the erection of the house of God. But his son, a man of peace, which is a meaning of the name Solomon, would construct it. There in his allegory, that the true temple would be built by the Prince of Peace. The book of Samuel tells how King David bought Mount Moriah from Oran the Jebusite, who owned a threshing floor on its summit, for 50 shekels of silver. David wanted to build an altar to give thanks to the end of a pestilence which had decimated the men of his kingdom. In giving thanks, David said, this is now God's house and place of sacrifice. And in due time, the temple was built upon the site of the Jebusite's threshing floor. So even before the foundations were laid, the site was called the house of God. This story is well known how Solomon made a contract with Hiram, king of Tyre, to furnish the cedars and timbers of Cyprus cut from the forests of Lebanon. And he requested the services of skilled workmen, especially those skilled in working in gold, silver, and brass. King Hiram sent a man, the son of a woman, of the daughters of Dan. Under his guidance, the framework of the temple was erected and furnished. 
Tradition named this man Hiram Abiff. Then, in the middle of the construction of the temple, Solomon sent and fetched another Hiram of Tyre, the son of a widow of the tribe of Nabali, a worker in brass who made the pillars and molten sea, and lavers, and various vessels and other equipment. There is reason to believe that Hiram of Tyre, the widow's son, was the son of the first skilled workman of the king of Tyre sent to his king Solomon to design and construct the temple. Abif means, in Hebrew, his father. But it appears that Hiram Abif disappeared mysteriously before the temple equipment was finished, and his son, the skilled worker in brass, completed the job. It is interesting to note that in Masonic tradition, a man associated with the building of Solomon's temple is killed before it is completed. This sarcophagus of King Hiram of Biblis was discovered in 1923. The Bible describes his workmen as master builders, and no doubt some of these were loaned to Solomon to assist in the building of the temple. In Jerusalem was set up the throne of King David of Israel, and through a long succession of royal princes, the kings of Judah reigned in the great palaces of Zion. The ancient cities of King David and Herod lie in ruins many feet below the present street level, but the mountains still stand around Jerusalem, as they did when King David's throne was set up in Zion. part of the old city, known as Mount Moriah, or Temple Hill, was the site of both the first temple built by Solomon and the second built by Zerubbabel, and which was later enlarged by Herod. Today, on this site, there are two mosques. The most famous is the Octagon Mosque of Omar, completed in 644 A.D., with its beautiful Persian tiles that glow blue, green, and gold. On the account of its magnificent golden dome, it is also known as the Dome of the Rock. Muhammad visited Jerusalem, and the Muslim faith maintained that he ascended to heaven from the rock the mosque contains. This rock is the exposed top of the mountain where, according to tradition, Abraham prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac. The Bible relates the story. As they climbed the mountain, Isaac was curious because no lamb was being taken with him to provide a burnt offering. His father replied, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. When Isaac realized that he was to be the lamb, he made himself a willing sacrifice. Then, as his knife raised, Abraham's hand was stayed on the command of an angel. He stopped, turned, and there behind him was a ram with his horns entangled in a thicket. God had provided a substitute for Isaac. In thankfulness, Abraham called the place Yahweh Jerah, which means Yahweh will provide. At that moment, we perhaps wonder if Abraham had a vision of a great city which was to rise in splendor upon that very mountaintop. And perhaps he saw the serene face of the one who offered himself as a sacrifice to redeem his people Israel. The Mount of Olives still looks down on Temple Hill, as in the day when Jesus of Nazareth wept over the city. Despite the city's name, which means the city of peace, Jerusalem has been the battleground for over 28 invasions. One of the most notable of the sieges was the capture of the city by the First Crusade in June 1099 AD. The first assault lasted 10 days, but failed to breach the city walls. Then, in answer to a vision that promised victory, the crusaders with cross and banners, and led by the bishops and lesser clergy, marched barefoot around the holy city. From timber cut from the surrounding forest, the crusaders constructed castles on wheels. 
designed to be pushed up against the walls from which attacks could be led. Also built were powerful catapults and various siege engines. Centuries before, the Assyrians used exactly the same method to assault the town of Lachish in Palestine. The city defenders countered with a hail of stones and rivers of liquid fire that destroyed some of the siege towers, while archers on the walls shot blazing arrows down on the attackers as they mounted the towers. When nearly all hope of capturing the city was gone, one group of knights was able to secure a foothold on one part of the walls. And as they appeared over the top, the defenders fled, enabling the knights to open the Damascus gate and let the main body of the crusaders in. That evening, the leaders of the crusade, who only a week before had filed barefoot around the seemingly impregnable walls, entered the Church of the Holy Sepulcher to offer thanks to God for their victory. Their first act was to turn the Dome of the Rock into a Christian shrine, renaming it Templin Domine, or Temple of the Lord. However, when the Muslims under Saladin recaptured the city in 1197, the golden cross was hurled to the ground from the top of the dome, and the crescent, the symbol of Islam, was restored. Much of the history of this ancient place is related to the Bible. This is how the city of David might have looked in about 1000 BC. For many years, archaeologists have been excavating in the fallen masonry of Jerusalem, searching for the sacred sites of the Bible. Oh, it's coming out nice. This broken jar handle was found with a seal impression in Hebrew lettering, Jerusalem, around a five-pointed star, the seal of Solomon. Today, the old part of the city of Jerusalem is enclosed within a well granulated wall, built in 1538 AD in the reign of the Turkish Sultan, Suleiman II. These walls circuit two and a half miles around the city and are built of Jerusalem stone. The city still presents the appearance of a fortress, for these old battlements are nearly 40 feet high and have protective towers set at intervals. The tower now visible above the wall is only the top part of a colossal wall of masonry that extends many feet below the ground, and it is part of the so-called Castle of Antonia. Its base is believed to have been part of the north corner of the city in the time of Solomon. There are several gates to the city, and all but the Golden Gate were the work of the 16th century Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. The Golden Gate seen here was built around the Byzantine era and has been sealed shut for nearly a thousand years. It is noteworthy from the writings of Ezekiel's prophecies that the gate would be shut, quoting from the scriptures, because the Lord God of Israel hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. These prophetic words received a striking fulfillment when Christ, on that Palm Sunday, entered the city through that gate. Christ was fulfilling the words of Zechariah 9, verse 9. Lo, your king comes to you, triumph and victorious is he, humble and riding on an ass. The foundations of that ancient gate were discovered some feet below the present gate. From the Golden Gate, the wall stretches for over a thousand feet toward the southeast corner with various projections and openings. This section is a reconstruction made by the Arabs some 300 years ago. Excavations made by the base of the wall revealed blocks of masonry believed to be part of King Solomon's period. The so-called Wailing Wall is sometimes referred to incorrectly as part of Solomon's Temple. In reality, it was only constructed by the Idumean Herod the Great to enlarge the courtyard. Today, Jews of mixed nationalities and races consider this wall their most sacred site. They come here to chant their plaintive hymn called the Wailing Song. This famous wall extends onward beneath the city. The Jews pray for the advent of the Messiah to restore Israel's greatness, whereas Christians recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah who did come. 
a prelude to his second coming as king to establish his kingdom on earth, as is prophesied in the scriptures. The most elegant of the portals which pierce the walls encircling Jerusalem is the Damascus Gate. It is comparably modern, was built about 300 years ago. Excavations reveal remains of another gate about 15 feet below it. Possibly this gate might have been the one through which St. Paul set out on his tour of the persecuted Christians before his conversion to the faith of Christ. And through this gate, the brave crusader Tancred and his followers made their victorious entrance into the city of Jerusalem. Behind the Damascus Gate, there is a maze of narrow streets and dark arcades, a jumble of stone houses and sites, holy to the three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The foundations of Solomon's Temple were sunk into the solid rock, and archaeologists excavating the southeast corner have traced the old wall to a depth of 68 feet below the existing ground level. Solomon, who was probably at the laying of the foundation stones of the new temple, expresses the symbolism of the foundation when he wrote this in the book of Psalms, the righteous is an everlasting foundation. The same thought reappears in the letter to the Hebrews. They looked for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Well, since God is truth, it follows that the solid rock upon which Solomon's temple was built symbolizes the truth upon which a man builds his own spiritual house, the true temple of God. These standing walls are of several rebuildings from Herod's time as far up as the 15th century AD. Recent excavations have exposed lower and earlier courses. Some stones measure about four feet high and over 14 feet in length and weigh many tons. On these stones were found many mason marks in Phoenician lettering, together with several specialist markings. At the southeast corner of the city, the walls tower 77 feet above ground level, and their foundations 79 feet below the ground level, making the masonry 156 feet from top to bottom. This lower level masonry is Herodian. The stone for Solomon's buildings came from quarries beneath the city. One of these royal quarries was discovered in 1854, and this small opening is the entrance near the Damascus Gate. The main cavern is nearly 750 feet in depth and more than 3,000 feet in circumference. Columns left by the quarrymen to support the roof still exist. Traces of the techniques used by the workers are evident they made long incisions in the rock into which wooden wedges were hammered. Water was then poured over the dry wedges, which then swelled, cracking the rocks along the incisions, a procedure still used in modern quarries. Several massive blocks, partially cut, still show the marks of the picks and chisels and are so clear and fresh that one could easily imagine King Hiram's quarrymen had just downed tools for their midday lunch break. Large blocks lie as they were left by the workers, and just outside the quarry, stone chippings were found piled to a great depth, suggesting that the major building stones were dressed here by the masons before leaving the quarry. The Bible says, And the house, when it was in building, was built of stones made ready before they were brought thither. And continue the quote, So that there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. There have been many reproductions of the Bible's most famous building. These are the ideas of some of the artists. However, it must be pointed out that there is no biblical justification for these elaborate structures. This is the Howland Garber model of the temple to scale, and is a closer approach to the original structure than any other model yet produced. This is the northeast aspect. 
Basically, the temple was a simple house of two rooms arranged lengthways, with a roofed porch which protected the entrance. According to the Book of Kings, the temple took about seven and a half years to complete. The Temple of Solomon preserved and enhanced much of the symbolism found in his predecessor, the Tabernacle in the Wilderness. On comparing the Tabernacle, described by the historian Josephus, and the Temple described in the Scriptures, we see that all the arrangements in the Temple are identical. But there's one difference. All the Temple dimensions are exactly double those of the Wilderness Tabernacle. By doubling the former dimensions in all directions, and by thrice multiplying this increase, we obtain a volume eight times greater than the tabernacle. Eight is a number which symbolizes a new order or octave in the future. The forecourt of the temple was known as the court of the priests. On the right was the altar of burnt offerings, and on the left was the molten sea. The approach to the porch was by broad stairway and was used only by the priests carrying daily supplies into the temple. The open doorway into the temple was immense. It was about 15 feet wide and over 30 feet high. This great height was necessary to accommodate the two huge giant cherubim as well as the prefabricated flooring and roof pallets when raised on edge and moved into place inside the temple. Just outside and on each side of the doorway were two tall pillars about 27 feet high and 6 feet in diameter. Solomon named them Jotkin and Boaz. Although masonry has applied symbolism to them, the exact meaning of these names have been lost. Some scholars have suggested that they were key words in some kind of a cryptogram invoking the blessings of God upon King David's dynasty. They were closer than they knew. Although the pillars are described in the Book of Kings as castings of brass, most scholars believe that they were hollow wooden construction, copper covered, and highly decorated with floral designs. They were surmounted with chapters, which may also have served as braziers for the burning of incense or oil. Two rows of pomegranates were placed above decorated lily work around each chapter, perhaps similar to the design of these pomegranates found at Megiddo contemporary with the time of Solomon. Among the structural architecture and decorations of Solomon's temple, none have exerted more interest and conjecture than that of the two pillars on each side of the doorway. Having no structural function, it is believed that they were only decorative, unquestionably symbolic. However, we now know that in King Solomon's day, such named pillars served as perpetual witnesses to solemn contracts or covenants. At the time of the building of the temple, God made two covenants, one with Solomon's father David and the other with the people of the kingdom. Both are recorded in the book of Samuel. Since the Hebrew meaning of the word Jotkin is, he shall establish. It must surely refer to the covenant that God made with David to establish his throne forever. The Hebrew meaning of Boaz is given as, in it is strength. This must surely refer to the second covenant God made with David's people to plant them in a place of safety. And in that covenant was a promise of national strength. This great brass bowl held up by 12 brass oxen is known as the Molten Sea. In the Book of Kings, it is described as being 10 cubits in diameter and 5 cubits high. That is about 15 feet across and 7 and a half feet high and was used for washings by the priests. The enormous bowl was made from cast copper alloy about 3 inches thick and the brim was wrought like the brim of a cup like the flower of a lily. According to the Book of Kings it held 2,000 baths of water that is about 10,000 gallons. It is interesting to note that the capacity of the molten sea is identical with the volume of the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid of Egypt, and exactly 50 times the capacity of the coffer in the king's chamber.
There are several such relationships between King Solomon's Temple and the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt, which was built around 2623 BC, over 1500 years before the temple. In the forecourt of the temple was the altar of burnt offerings. It was built of stone and had a brass grate. It measured 30 feet square and was 15 feet high, and it had a flight of stairs going up one side. The Howland Garb model shows it built in rising ramp steps like a Babylonian temple tower. It was crowned with a horned altar, but there is no biblical text to support this. In Solomon's day, the shedding of blood in accordance with the law, as found in the book of Leviticus, was performed on the side of the altar northwards before the Lord. This was a practice started in Abraham's day about a thousand years earlier. The direction northwards thus prophetically foreshadowed the coming great sacrifice in the age of the true tabernacle of the Christian era, for Christ was crucified on the north side of the city of Jerusalem, near Golgotha, the place of the skull. The site is still recognized by its spectacular rock formation, the caves in the rock suggesting eyeless sockets in his skull. Among the bronze objects made by King Hiram of Tyre's workers were ten brass stands on wheels, known as lavers, each holding about 200 gallons of water, which was used to cleanse the individual sacrifices. The ten lavers, in a prophetic sense, indicated the ten-tribed house of Israel, through which in a future dispensation would flow the spiritual water, meaning Jesus Christ, for the cleansings of the offerings of mankind. Round about the temple were constructed side chambers consisting of three floors divided into rooms or cells. They were probably used as treasure chambers or storage places for priestly garments or equipment. This model shows no side windows, only because none are mentioned in the Bible. However, it is likely that there were slots in the walls for light and ventilation. The book of Ezekiel suggests that there were 33 cubicles on each floor, making a total of 99. The Bible states that from the lowest floor of the side chambers there were winding steps up to the second level and on to the third. But the meaning of the Hebrew words are not clear. This is one interpretation by Professor Waterman of the University of Michigan. Although the larger entrance to the temple was without doors, the openings from the porch into the main room of the temple was provided with a pair of folding doors, having hinges of gold, according to the Book of Kings. The doorposts would have hung on metal pivots set in stone sockets, such as this one found at Tel Asmar. The inscriptions are words of dedication. The holy place was a spacious room given by some scholars as being 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. The walls were covered with panels of cedar wood carvings overlaid with gold. However, the Hebrew word overlaid is more accurately translated inlaid. The carvings consisted of cherubim, palm trees, and flowers, which were commonly used decorative motifs in Solomon's time. Repeated around the walls in Phoenician style were pairs of cherubim facing palm trees, considered in Solomon's day to be the tree of life because of its longevity and fruitfulness. The cherubim symbolized the guardians of the temple, as perhaps the cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden. The cherubim portrayed in the model were copied from this bas relief found in the excavations of ancient Biblis. It was one of the supports of the throne from King Harm's palace. The holy place contained several articles brought in from the wilderness tabernacle and placed in the temple. One was a table of showbread on which were placed twelve flat loaves of bread, which the priests brought fresh into the holy place each Sabbath morning, one loaf for each of the twelve Hebrew tribes, who someday were to become like unto the bread of life. In the parable of the wheat field, these mystical loaves were to be of the good seed of the kingdom, appointed for 
the nourishment of mankind. Another article from the tabernacle was the altar of incense used to provide that sweet smell the Israelite priests thought was acceptable to God. The fragrance of the incense was also symbolic of the prayers of the faithful, as found in Psalms 141. This design is based upon a stone altar with corner horns, unearthed at Megiddo, its dimensions being almost identical with those set out in the Book of Kings. The original was said to have been made of acacia wood, and according to the scriptures, was overlaid with gold. The candlesticks of which the King James Bible speaks are more accurately understood when considered as lamp holders. The seven-branched candelabra of the holy place in the tabernacle was replaced by ten single lampstands in the temple, five on the right and five on the left. The menorah-type candlesticks were never used in Solomon's day. Certainly none have been found to date, dating to his period, the 11th century B.C. This model is fashioned after several found doing various excavations in the Holy Land, made to burn oil through seven wick channels. In allegory, the ten candlesticks foreshadowed the light which would be diffused in the Christian era by the house of Israel, that is, the northern ten tribes of Israel, in a future dispensation. The ten northern tribes were taken into captivity by the Assyrians in the 8th century B.C. and are spoken of today as the lost ten tribes of Israel. When the second temple was built under the direction of Zerubbabel, the ten tribes were in exile, far from Palestine. Thus, only one candlestick was placed in his temple. It represented the house of Benjamin, one of the smaller tribes of Israel, and was given as a light to the house of Judah. From the holy place there were steps which led up to the doorway of the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary. The most holy place was the location of the Ark of the Covenant. The doorposts were of olive wood, the olive being the symbol of priestly Israel, and Israel is called in the book of Exodus a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Israel did so become in the early years of the Christian dispensation, as recorded in the writings of St. Peter. Thus we find that olive wood stands as a symbol of the ten tribes in their ultimate condition of consecration. They were to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar people, peculiar meaning special. As entry to the inner temple could only be through its doorway, which was olive wood, it shows that symbolically entry must be made through the doorway of sanctified Israel. There are biblical grounds to believe that from the holy place there was a raised vestibule or porch at the top of the stairs before entering the Holy of Holies. The Book of Kings describes a porch in a way which would indicate four sides of a pentagon jutting out from its fifth side abutting the wall between the holy place and the holy of holies. The Moffat translation of the Bible also suggests there was a porch. He made doors of olive wood, the vestibule, and the pilasters formed a pentagon. The pilasters could refer to the Almagud pillars which are mentioned in the Book of Kings. Standing at each of the intersecting corners of a pentagon, they focus the eye of the observer already cast upward by the flight of stairs even higher, conveying the feeling of exaltation expressed in the lofty doors and the ceiling of the temple. Although the priests could look from the holy place through the open doorway into the darkened chamber, only the high priest saw its esoteric beauty from within. In like manner, just as many had seen Jesus, only his disciples could really say, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Inside the Holy of Holies, seen on the right, was the Ark of the Covenant, resting under the overhanging wings of two giant cherubim. We have no precise description of them other than their dimensions, and that they were made of olive wood. These gold-plated wooden statues, over ten feet high, seemed to the people of Israel to be appropriate attendants for their invisible God. They may have been thought of as a visible symbol of God moving from place to place. 
the second book of Samuel reads, And he, meaning God, rode upon a cherubim and did fly. The giant cherubim may have been copied from this cherubim throne, found in Biblis, contemporary with Solomon's day. There have been many representations of the Ark of the Covenant, even in motion picture films. It was a chest made of olive wood, overlaid with gold. It was a symbolic seat of Yahweh's authority in the holy place. It had two hinged lids of beaten gold and gold rings at each of its four corners for the two carrion poles. The ark's construction was Hollywood, again suggests a priestly Israel in the future. My design follows more closely the biblical description of the ark. The lid, or top surfaces of the ark, came to be referred to as the mercy seat. It was annually sprinkled with the blood of a goat and a bullock, according to the book of Leviticus. The interpretation of this act by the high priest is recorded in St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews in its ninth chapter. But Christ, being become a high priest of good things to come, by greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Thus, by using symbols to represent those who are the nearest and the furthest from God, priests by the bullocks and heathen by the goats, the temple ritual foreshadowed that on behalf of all mankind, Christ entered once and for all time into the presence of the throne of God to effect our atonement. The manna and Aaron's rod deposited in the ark during the period of the wilderness tabernacle depicted the true bed of life which would come down from heaven and the true high priest, and through the foreknowledge that this symbolism would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The manna and Aaron's rod were therefore not continued in the temple of Solomon, which we now know was a type of the post-resurrection Christian era. So, in the typical temple, there rested in the ark only the tablets of the law, a typology which had not yet been terminated by reason of fulfillment. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, Christ says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle shall in no way pass from the law, to all be fulfilled. Much of the allegory and symbolism of Solomon's temple were the continuance in enhanced form of that of the wilderness tabernacle. But now we note new allegories which apply to the establishment of the Davidic kingdom which allegories are prophetic of its glories, not merely under its earthly rulers, but more particularly under Christ, who in three days built the true temple himself, of which King Solomon's was but a forerunner or type. Although acacia wood was used in the construction of the wilderness tabernacle, cedar wood was used in Solomon's temple. King David's own residence was also used cedar, and this delicately scented wood became the symbol of the everlasting house of David. In the book of Samuel, we read, where in honor of David's noble thought, God would add to him a house to bear his name, and which would be both everlasting and from his own loins, a noble house and lineage to continue on down through the ages as far as the present day and beyond. Nathan the prophet tells David this, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house, and when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish the throne of thy kingdom forever. This is the first of the two covenants that God made in conjunction with the conception of the building of Solomon's temple. This first covenant was with David and was symbolized by the pillar Jotkin. Here is perhaps one of the most important truths to be revealed by this study of King Solomon's temple. We find that King David's pious desire for a house of God was reciprocated by God. 
that which David wished to build for him, he also, in an allegorical sense, would build for David. A house, a kingdom, a throne, forever to be established, but not in the Holy Land. For God says in the book of Samuel, and this is the second covenant that God made this time with the people of David's kingdom and symbolized by the pillar Boaz. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Well, since Israel was then in the Holy Land of Palestine, it follows that this appointed place had to be somewhere else. The question is, where is that appointed place? After a lapse of some 2,400 years, it could be thought that all hope of tracing the Israel people to their appointed land, as recorded in the second book of Samuel, would be an impossibility. Bible history tells us that between 745 and 700 BC, the 10 tribes of the northern house of Israel were carried into Assyrian captivity and were placed in Halah, Hebar, and the city of the Medes, where they are called in Assyrian history records, Gimera or Qumri. Bible history also tells us that later the vast majority of the southern house of Judah were also taken into captivity by Sennacherib into Assyria. And together with the people of Israel who had preceded them collectively became known as the Lost Tribes of Israel. They were a vast multitude of several million. In 586 B.C., Jerusalem, that had held out against the Assyrians, was captured by the Babylonians. The city and the house of God built by King Solomon was burnt, and all the treasures were carried into Babylon. Most of the population were taken away by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon, where they were held captive for some 70 years. Neither Assyria nor Babylon could have been the appointed land as Israel's afflictions did not cease, nor, as the scripture says, they were living in their own safety. When Babylon fell to the Persians, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the Persian king, to release the exiled Judeans to return to Jerusalem. But less than 50,000 out of approximately 600,000 taken to Babylon ever returned to the city to rebuild it and the temple. A census was taken, and the scribe recorded a mixture of Judeans, Babylonians, and Edomites. Collectively, they were called Jews, a name never having been applied to any Hebrews prior to the Babylonian captivity. Obviously, Palestine could not have been the appointed place, because it was in Palestine that the covenant was made to remove the nation to a new land. So we are back to the question, where is that appointed land? The answer was found in 1847 by archaeologists excavating Sennacherib's palace in the ruins of ancient Nineveh. In Sennacherib's library were uncovered some 23,000 clay cuneiform tablets outlining the history and records of the Assyrian Empire. Among the tablets were reports on the activities of the captive Israel people who had been placed on the borders of the empire to act as buffers against attacks from outside enemies. Although translated in 1930, their relevance to Israel was overlooked due to the fact that the Assyrians called Israel by other names. These are the actual tablets I found in the British Museum that had been translated by Professor Waterman of the University of Michigan. Combining translations with later records on later monuments revealed the startling information. The Israelites that had been carried captive into the upper borders of Assyria, rose in rebellion against the continuing tribute required by Assyria, and started a migration northward. One tablet recorded that the Assyrian army was ordered to stop this migration, and several battles are recorded, including a major force led by the Assyrian king, Esar Haddon. However, he was unable to stop the exodus due to a series of brilliant rear guard actions by Israel. Even the Caucasus Mountains, a formidable barrier to Israel's migrations northwest, failed to stop the flow as they poured through the burial pass, called to this day the Pass of Israel, 
a name that has puzzled scholars for centuries. After passing through the Caucasus Mountains, Israel settled in Scythia and the Carpathian region, west of the Black Sea and in the Crimea. Do you realize that we have now merged in the known world history found in many textbooks? Books that show these areas as the original homelands of the Cimmerians, Cimbri, and Scythians. However, they failed to realize that all these people are, in fact, the descendants of the people of the northern kingdom of ancient Israel. Textbooks erroneously indicate that the so-called lost tribes of Israel had all been absorbed or amalgamated with the people of Assyria and Media. Modern textbooks trace these Cimmerians and Scythians west to become Normans, Saxons, Danes, Gauls, Goths, and Vikings, just to name a few, Many nationalities, but one race of people. The Cimmerians, later known as Celts, became the bedrock of the British nation, later to accept an infusion of the Normans, Anglo-Saxons, Scandinavians, and kindred people. Archaeology has thus solved two great mysteries, the fate of the countless thousands of Israelites from both the northern house of Israel and the southern house of Judah, who disappeared into Assyria and Media. And where did the vast number of Scythian and Cimmerians, who became Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, and Scandinavian people come from that suddenly appeared north and west of the Caucasus Mountains, all at the same time in history? The answer is simple. They were one and the same people. And God fulfilled his covenant with King David, symbolized by the pillar Boaz in Solomon's temple as the people of David's kingdom migrated over the centuries into Western Europe and the coastlands and islands of Britain, where they became a multitude of nations with a new name, a new language, with all trace of their ancient ancestry forgotten. All this was foretold by God through the prophets of Israel in the books of the Old Testament. From these dispersed nations of Israel, God gathered people for a special purpose, to fulfill Israel's responsibilities and destiny. Led by our pilgrim fathers, they risk life and limb to cross the ocean for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. In their little ship, the Mayflower, they sailed across the broad Atlantic to plant the first colony in the wilderness of America at Plymouth. As representatives of King David's people, they had reached the appointed land that God promised them. Instinctively, the Pilgrim Fathers recognized a covenant relationship with God and expressed this thought in calling themselves God's new Israel and the seed of Abraham. They were unknowingly fulfilling God's promise to Abraham. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. God also fulfilled his covenant with David, symbolized by the pillar Jotkin, that David's throne would continue as long as the sun, moon, and stars continue in the heavens. David's throne has moved several times over the centuries, and today is found in Westminster Abbey in London, where Queen Elizabeth II was crowned on June 2, 1953, seated upon the coronation chair that houses the stone known as Jacob's Pillar a stone which had been traced from Jerusalem to Egypt, into Ireland, Scotland, and England, although in 1997 the stone was returned to Scotland. Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, who had a long line of Irish and Scottish ancestors, is a direct descendant of King David of Israel. The dedication of Solomon's Temple was held during the Feast of Tabernacles, and the first act of the dedication was to bring the Ark of the Covenant from its resting place on Mount Ophir to the temple. With the blowing of silver horns by the priests, King Solomon himself led the procession, followed by the national representatives and the priests. Then came the Levites, carrying the sacred burden of the ark and all the holy vessels. This ivory pomegranate scepter head found in Jerusalem may have been in that actual procession. It is the only known artifact existing from Solomon's temple. Its inscription reads, Belong to the house of Yahweh and holy to the priests. 
It is interesting to note that Solomon gave explicit instructions to the people regarding their prayers to God. When they prayed in time of famine or pestilence and in time of war, they were to pray toward this place, that is, toward Jerusalem. It is significant that most of the great churches and cathedrals in Britain and Europe are orientated to be built on a line east-west, with a high altar being in the east end. Even Masonic temples are designed, if possible, on the east-west line. Thus, perhaps unknowingly, Masons too are praying toward the east, toward Jerusalem. I have heard it said that Masonry, an organization in which Solomon's temple plays an important part, is not Christian in nature. I am not a Mason. But in studying early Masonic books on their degrees in Masonry, I noted that it was quite evident that for centuries Masonry was Christian. It was only in 1723 that all references to Christianity were deleted by a Dr. James Anderson. However, expressive symbols so distinctively Christian in character remained so that they cannot be concealed from the most unobservant. I am told that in some Masonic degrees, they are even a prerequisite for advancement. I have also read that the aim of Masonry is to raise one up to the morality of the Bible. And if this is true, then I can reply, if Christianity is rejected from Masonry, then the morality of the Bible is unattainable. I also maintain that the Christian symbolism found in King Solomon's Temple is the same as found in the Old and New Testaments. You have now seen revealed some of the fulfilled symbolism of King Solomon's temple. Knowledge of this fulfillment is necessary to fully understand the wonderful truths that God directed David to incorporate into the design of the temple. I respectfully suggest that such knowledge is required to complete the divine purpose for which each of us was ordained to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation so as to take our places in the true temple of which Solomon's was bought a forerunner. I also hope that I have given each of you a new incentive to study your Bible, that it may become a lamp to light your way, making a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, the true Lord of the living temple.